The title of the talk, CSR Ethics, Business or Politics, is designed to take us to the questions of the meaning of CSR, how and, and how and why it changes. If you think CSR is actually nothing to do with any of these three things, you'll have your chance to tell us uh, in a discussion. I don't want to be too technical about these core terms. Um, it, it, broadly speaking, when we talk about ethics, we're talking about doing the right thing. When I talk about business, I mean a business case for corporate social responsibility, if you like the best thing from a business perspective. And when I talk about politics, I'm sort of referring to making and taking governance, engagement with governing institutions, the politic thing. Not necessarily in a, in a negative Shakespearean sort of context, but it, it can be politic to engage in politics without being dastardly. And, and that's my assumption for the moment at least. The plan of the talk, uh, I'll first of all say a little bit about corporate social responsibility, why it's important, and why I suggest the question I pose is an important one. Then I will introduce the three perspectives, and then I'll try and make sense of the confusion that the three perspectives might uh, bring, and then I'll hand over to you. So what is CSR? And of course, there are multiple definitions, and you might immediately think, well, the choice of de definition will beg questions about the answer to the question, ethics, business, or politics. I use a very capacious definition of corporate social responsibility, and this actually comes from previous and continuing work with Dirk, Dirk Matten. Policies, strategies, and practices of corporations that reflect business responsibility for some wider societal good. Yet the precise manifestation and direction of the responsibility lie at the discretion of the corporation. And you'll notice uh, um, immediately that this definition doesn't privilege or exclude ethics, business, or politics. And as some of you probably know who know too much about the CSR field, many of the definitions actually do privilege or exclude these concepts. So ours is a capacious one, so we're leaving room for corporate social responsibility that's motivated and reflects any balance of those three things, potentially at least. Narrowly, corporate social responsibility, i.e. the social responsibility of modern corporations, has been with us for about a century. When the first corporations emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century, considerations of social responsibility were apparent, certainly in the minds of commentators, uh, also the critical journalists, whose names are, what were they called? I can't think what they were called now. Uh, anyway, a bunch of critical journalists, and also business leaders, who were concerned about, well, what responsibilities come with being a corporation? The idea of muckrakers, I think is what they were called, muckrakers. The idea of business having social responsibility more broadly, I, business, qua business, even inside the special circumstances of corporations, have been with us for millennia. Many, most a, ancient societies had conceptions of social responsibility. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Today, there, again, the experts will know all about this. There are many variants. So we get different sorts of terms, some of which overlap with corporate social responsibility. And usually they're designed actually to highlight a particular element, which they think the authors think the general term doesn't quite capture. Well, I use corporate citizenship because I'm interested in political questions of the role of the corporation. The Ed Freeman School, stakeholder management. The accountants, corporate accountability in the last a decade or so, corporate sustainability, and following Michael Porter and um, Mark Kramer, creating shared value. And of course, at this moment, it's worth noting that sometimes these terms are designed to enable academics and consultants to make their mark. Why, though, is it important to understand corporate social responsibility? And this, I think, is pretty self-evident to an audience like this. The status of corporations brings immense privileges, extremely significant market and social roles, and immense power. 
power of taste forming, power to lever the political systems in which the corporations offer, uh, will operate. So there's something about the status of corporations that I believe makes corporate social responsibility an important topic. Moreover, corporate social responsibility can provide legitimacy for corporations in these contexts. It can provide legitimacy for corporations' roles in mass consumption, production, distribution, various externalities which business brings through international value chains. Their roles in governing, the provision of critical infrastructure upon which so much depends, ICT, water, energy, the very air itself. So corporate social responsibility, for better or for worse, can provide legitimacy for corporations who have this status in these very basic uh, facets of our lives. That legitimacy is also vital to the corporations. I believe, and some people query this, but you can do later on, I believe that corporations do depend on legitimacy from society at large. The mechanisms we might talk a little bit about, often a little bit hard to see, but I think underneath there's an awareness in corporations about the need for it. They obviously need legitimacy with their core stakeholders, investors, employees, workers, customers. And they also need legitimacy with governments, the people who license the corporations, the people who offer the contracts for a lot of business, who provide access to natural resources, and even extend governing roles to corporations. The governments themselves may extend governing roles to corporations. Of course, there's the risk that, corporate, that CSR can provide legitimacy illegitimately, but we can return to that in discussion. So CSR, I, I, I put it to you, is important. It's important because of the roles of corporations. It's important because it provides a legitimacy, and that legitimacy we might want to be sure about, might want to test. But CSR itself is still hard to evaluate. It won't stand still, for one thing. In the time I've been studying it, which <coughs> shudder to think about it actually, sometimes, uh, nearly 40 years, 35, 36 years, um, it's changed immensely from dealing with fairly core cool stakeholder issues, employees and communities back in the 1980s through in the 1990s supply chains and environmental effects of business. But now if you read the headlines and even look at some of the associations and the commitments that businesses make to issues of whole value chains, whole value chains. So a Danish company, Arla, is interested in the conditions of a farmer that's producing something that goes into their supply chain, but may not employ the farmer, may not even buy directly from them, they may buy, but buy the milk through a cooperative. Whole societies, corporations are claiming responsibility for, and the planet itself. So, or not so, but my purpose today is actually to get behind these particular agendas, of, which are specific in terms of time and place, and think instead of the core of CSR and the place of ethics, business and politics in it, and the relationship of one to the other, or to each other. Well, let's start with the, with the ethics. Of course, there are very long-standing traditions of ethical framing of wealth, the use of wealth, and this, by and large, not always, often went with business in ancient societies. And we see sets of ethics in societies north, south, east and west. Often around that wealthy people and businesses should conform with wider societal ethics, often specifying notions of care, sociability, reciprocity. Some of these perspectives have theological or spiritual roots. In the West, and I think you, you can see this for 200 years, um, underlying assumptions about bringing ethics to business are often conceptualized in terms of, slightly more practical terms perhaps, stewardship, paternalism, philanthropy. Again, you can weigh up the merits of these if you like. And of course there are various analytical perspectives 
anti-utilitarian, feminist, and so on. Well, I want to leave the differentiation aside just to, but merely to signal the significance of ethics in CSR. Many businesses are led by ethical motivation, uh, and sometimes we're a bit sceptical about this. I met a little Robert once, and I'm very persuaded about the passion which she brought to her business, particularly concerning animal rights, animal ethics, and the ethics of international development and business. I don't know the Ben and Jerry's folks or the Patagonia folks. These companies like the body shop, at least the erstwhile body shop before it got sold to uh, who was it? Laurie. Laurie. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, ben and Jerry's retains its own board within Unilever. I don't think the body shop enjoyed that. Some companies are even trying, telling us they're trying to bring the ethics back in. I don't think Unilever would be a case of point under Paul Pullman. I think making serious attempts to understand the implications of sustainability for a giant like Unilever. And I've recently come across a new business and social uh, civil society coalition called the B Team including very, some dubious character with a beard who runs transport and aeroplanes, but, but not altogether a bad guy, I'm sure. The claims of the B team are to move beyond CSR as a vehicle for profit to doing business for social and planetary well-being. Defenders of the place of ethics as the core of corporate social responsibility would contend against the other two possibilities I've offered, the business case and other politics. They would contend as follows. We can't redu reduce CSI to the business case. What's the business case for human rights? Human rights may well involve costs for a corporation. A business case consideration would therefore eclipse the significance of human rights in a company driven by the business case. So says the ethical perspective. And on the other hand, we can't assume that political motivation for CSR is ethical. Political positioning is often very unethical, competitive. We can think of cases like how most car companies position themselves to try and get special favours with regulations concerning ozone emissions. In, uh, in Europe in the early part of the century. Governments themselves are a dodgy lot, susceptible to corruption, particularly in the uh, resources sector, unethical behaviour when it comes to human rights. So what I've tried to do is show uh, an, an ethical tradition in business responsibility, some exemplars, and show how they would position, the advocates of this view would position themselves against the other two views. Well, let's come to the, the business, business value, the business case. A CSR <coughs> serves the company, will best serve the society. So there's some harmony in good for the business and good for the society. Of course, any other approach would mean that the business would be undermining its own long-term ability to serve society if it undercut its strength by short-run generosity, not in its own interest, the corporation would be crippled in context of further sociability. Leaving aside the question of abusing uh, investors' money, the accountability issue, just leaving that aside for the moment. And of course, corporations have to recognize the interests of their main stakeholders who value the return on investment Particularly pension funds and insurance funds in which we all are so heavily invested. Jobs, incomes, meaning in life even. The unalienated labour oh, let's not go there. <laughs> Goods and services, and of course custom from other businesses. And what, so what lies behind this, this business approach to CSR? The idea that serving society and business go hand in hand. Well, first of all, I'd say it's a long-term, it's a long-standing relationship or assumption. Uh, even Robert Owen, the great founder of the British Cooperative Movement, about 200 years ago, this year about, uh, argued that fair treatment of workers 
could re result in a return equal to 50 to 100% on investment. It doesn't sound like Robert Owen, but it was Robert Owen. So an assumption that somehow there is a, a reciprocity treating, in this case, the stakeholders, the workers, well, will yield benefits for the corporation. Uh, or, uh, corporation. And of course, if you look at some, quite a few of the stories of the way multinational corporations in the last d decade, two decades, have adopted environmental policies, strategies, and practices, you find that they are very motivated by cost savings. Many of the CEOs received a dossier saying, you can actually save money by reusing water. <laughs> Shock, horror. So again, virtuous circle, but environmental responsibility can uh, very easily equate with the bottom line. And of course, most famously, the strategy guru, Michael Porter, in collaboration with Mark Kramer, has come up with this phrase, creating shared value, which one has to concede has had much more impact on the business sector than the works of Matter and Moon and, and others, he said with feeling. And, and Porter, Porter's message, I mean, it's easily derided by the, some of the academics, but let's, you know, it's, he says, deploy the whole of business for social good. Deploy the whole business, not just the profits. Sometimes it is a bit of a radical shift. And the idea is to create shared value in socially located business networks. And this is a, actually a better way of serving society than governments can manage. And it's the way to have the best business. Virtue would be its own reward. I don't think they said that, but they could say that. Again, defenders of this position will contend with our other two positions from the business case position. Business is simply not equipped to or accountable for addressing complex ethical judgments. They're good at matching demand, supply, bringing factors of production together, creating value. Why do others want to impose their ethics on our business? Might be another res response of theirs. And even if we accept that a business must be ethical, which I think these all, all would do, I'm sure Porter would, we still have to our core stakeholder interests, return on investment, jobs, goods, and custom. Turning to our other alternative core, the politics. Politics is a distraction from the core concern of business strategy. Regulators only inhibit innovation and enterprise. Compliance brings further costs. Echoing Porter and Kramer, actually business can do more good through philanthropy than paying taxes to corrupt or inept governments. Business-based CSR can actually bring higher social standards than government regulators, as some would claim in the Bangladesh garment industry today. Let's turn to our third position. Corporations and CSR reflect and should engage with government. Well, first of all, we have, again, a 2,000-year-old story told by a, a wonderful American academic, Avi Yona, about corporations, the 2,000-year history of corporations reflecting governments, government design, government creation. More specifically, for 400 years, businesses have been giving money away, called philanthropy, very big in America particularly, but also in other countries. Hang on a minute. It's the 1601 Charitable Usages Act, you say as one. Of course it is. An act of parliament, sometimes called the Elizabethan Act, passed 400 plus years ago in England, and inherited by its erstwhile colonies on the other side of the Atlantic, and Commonwealth countries, but also uh, companies, uh, countries rather, out with the uh, British reach. 
philanthropy in many, many, many contexts simply reflects government. So too does the idea of the American health insurance package. If you take a job in America, people say, how much are you going to get? And what well, you say, well, the package is worth, and the package is the salary plus the value of, for example, health insurance, which, of course, is also uh, subsidized by government through tax expenditures. But most frequently, companies will claim this is part of their CSR. In our 2008 article, Matt and I discussed the way Starbucks talked about this as part of their CSR. Moreover, the political sphere is the central locus of business license, rules, adjudication, awards of public contracts, public, <coughs> public policy partnerships. And many governments have a burning interest in the conditions for profitable and responsible business. Corporations always lobby for private interests. Through their business associations, they lobby for also for uh, a level playing field. So it's perfectly logical that CSR should collect with politics, they would submit. And I've come across in, in Scandinavia the term policy advocacy, uh, used to describe companies who want to slightly differentiate their activities from the other stuff, the regular lobbying. That policy advocacy is a way of putting together a more systematic set of reforms to a government. And of course, many companies have public customers sharing governing a part owned by government, that most, a lot of the Tata group has been or is part owned by government. And of course, they also create new regulatory contexts, and this is most obviously the case as a result of the ICT sector. I've been interested in uh, Google and the right to be forgotten, but all rules about, uh, uh, questions about rules introduced by Airbnb and Uber are doubtless well known to you. So, Again, defenders of the political view of CSR will contend with the other spheres, with the other views rather. It's the political sphere, not the corporation, that is the proper sphere for ethical frameworks to be aggregated, legitimised, institutionalised and adjudicated. It's, it's, this is a political thing, not for this corporation to, 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 to take up ethics. It's, 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 it's a wider cons consideration. Moreover, compliance should be considered a feature of CSR in, in many of the classic definitions, notably Archie Carroll's 1979 definition. It's an assumption. Compliance is part of it. It gets lost a bit now, and Mr. Porter and Mr. Kramer don't, don't seem to recognise it at all. But it certainly was in some of these earlier works from the likes of Archie Carroll. So there we have three views on the core of CSR, and with apologies to King Crimson, let confusion be CSR's epitaph. And quite often, one's inclined to think this. Given the number of definitions, the changing issue focus, the different significance of context, but even when you just present three simple concepts, like I have done, ethics, the business case, and the political. Is, therefore, CSR hopelessly confused? Is it impossible to evaluate CSR when we've got such different criteria, the ethical, the business case, and the political? Well, I'm being, probably my friends know I'm an incurable optimist, so I go at go it from the other end. Let's imagine the alternatives. Let's imagine ethics only CSR, without any value creating purpose. Doesn't seem quite right, does it? What's, 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 the, what's the point? I mean, business brings purpose, an objective to create value, albeit to sell it. Then could we imagine an ethics only CSR without governments to institutionalize business ethics? And actually, the, the history that I, that I follow shows very often, actually, business ethics do get well institutionalized by, by governments through accountability systems, governance systems, and much more. It's hard to imagine. The eth ethics can only work in a value-creating context. 
and with governments who institutionalise the good things that ethical CSR will bring. Turning to the business only CSR, could we imagine CSR without ethics? It simply wouldn't survive. Could we imagine it without governing institutions? Well, some do, and Mr. Porter again would be a case in point. Um, or at least he's, I think now he's slightly more on the back foot on, on this one, but uh, certainly some see CSR as an alternative to governing institutions in parlous circumstances. But they, these corporations don't necessarily see it as desirable. Again, we can come back to that in the discussion if you like. And then the politics only CSR. How could we have a politics only CSR which was about alignment with governing institutions without the compass of ethics? and without the capacity to, to create value, which business itself does. So, rather than give up in, on, on, on this conceptual soup, uh, I sort of want to initially propose that these three concepts could and should sit together and interact. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that, I don't think. No. Um, And I think well, what I want to do now in my sort of concluding comments on, on CSR is show how these combinations reflect some of the reality of CSR in its particular social settings. Um, I, in other words, I think we need to understand the interactions of ethics, business and politics to help, help us understand CSR and the way it changes. The question of tax is a terribly interesting one at the moment. It has been, I think, since the publication of Paradise Papers and other revelations about where companies and rich folk have kept their money. Legally, I repeat, legally. Starbucks in the UK. Starbucks in the UK, very well known, was a CSR company very charitable, tends to sell the supply chain ethical issues, creates public space for community groups in its cafes to have their meetings, and so on. Apl employed a business case for not paying the sort of tax you might have expected in the United Kingdom, in order, that, in order presumably, to save money, to use that money for better purposes, philanthropic ones perhaps, to provide a higher return on investment, to pay its workers more, all sorts of good reasons. There was a business case, I repeat, to conform with the rules. You could say, exploit the rules. And I would call this corporate social irresponsibility, a form of tax avoidance. Following the revelations of the uh, Panama Papers, ethical judgment came to visit Starbucks. Not every company was embarrassed by the revelations. Starbucks was. It prided itself, and still does, I imagine, on its CSR credentials, the reasons I've already hinted at. It's amended its behaviour. I don't know the full details of this story. I'm actually studying some other companies, not this one, and their tax at the moment, but the company clearly now pays more than nothing in the United Kingdom, in tax. I think actually they might, be tell, they might tell us how much they pay that. I'm trying to look it up. And moreover, they are, Starbucks is engaged with regulators about the appropriateness of the return that it makes. And employs such strategies, or doesn't employ such strategies, as creating artificial entities for which to return tax in Ireland or wherever it is. More widely, a number of organisations now are even making a new business case for adhering to the spirit of tax law. Hang on a minute, Jack. Say that again. Companies are saying, hang on a minute, maybe we shouldn't be like Starbucks was. Maybe we should adhere to the spirit of tax law and not create these artificial entities, uh, misspecify where, where the profits are earned and so forth. And it, business case is as follows. Investor reputation, confidence in cash flow in the event of fines, minimizing litigation risks, 
you might think paying taxes responsibly is ethical and is political. It conforms with the politics, engaged with the politics. It's hard to learn. But also, I'm saying, there's a business case, and this is being propounded by uh, some of the consultants and some of the CSR associations. Another interesting one to hit my desk in the last year was, doubtless other desks, the reformulation of the US Business Roundtable's statement on the purpose of a corporation. Historically, have a guess what the purpose of the corporation was described as. Anybody have a guess? Yeah, well, there or thereabouts, thank you, shareholder primacy. That was the purpose, uh, according to the US Business Roundtable. Curiously, they've now come up with another purpose. Two purposes, or one replacing another. I, I collapse different phrases from uh, the statement, just to give you the impression, give you the idea. To serve all Americans, shared prosperity and sustainability for both business and society, for our country. I'm not saying that all the corporations who are members of the round table, I think it's about 160, the big and famous ones, will turn the world, their worlds upside down. But they're making a statement, and these things come back to haunt companies and individuals when we make statements. And this seems to me to, again, reflect an ethical reformulation of, uh, of, of uh, CSR, and possibly, of course, some anticipated regulation. Mr. Trump actually is quite keen on regulations to uh, bring a business to address nationalistic causes. More, more generally, of course, we've got the approach of multinational corporations to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which, if you like, are sort of soft principles for governance from an international governmental organisation. That's what the UN is. Moreover, of course, it's endorsed. these SDGs are endorsed by many governments, and at least in Scandinavia, a number of these governments put soft rules, resources behind getting corporations to engage with these. SDGs, as we now call them. And of course, what's happening actually now is, again, I see this in Scandinavia, not so sure about the rest of the world, that corporations are, are addressing the SDGs, or telling us that they are, and they're looking for a business case. They're looking for, often about the environmental impacts, better reputation, uh, surer cash flow, and, and the like. But in other words, something like the SDGs is, is authored by a governmental entity. It reflects soft ethics, about, particularly around development and planetary sustainability, and the businesses are using, they try, try to find business cases to latch onto them and to connect with them. Maybe a cynical view of that. I don't always take a cynical view of these things, but it illustrates my, my general point about the interaction of these things. Um, more generally, again, it's, I've observed over the last 20 years, certainly, that quite a few CSR standards be have begun to acquire legal status. So quite often, in, uh, particularly in some uh, international supply chain cases, um, <coughs> um, the, the, the CSR standards get introduced into contracts. They're acquiring legal status. So that, uh, yeah. Moreover, again, curiously, in the last 20 years, and this is something I did a study on, myriad public policies have come out, particularly from European governments, to endorse, facilitate, and partner CSR. Lots of them. Moreover, national regulation of a more coercive variety is also moving to reflect the tenor and direction of private initiatives. So the sorts of supply chain standards, labour standards, that were introduced under various CSR initiatives have been adopted by various governments, particularly the attention to the need for due diligence in first-year supply, which is required in, uh, under various regulations in several European countries. More broadly, social and environmental reporting. This was quintessentially a business thing, possibly 
and tempered by ethical expectations of transparency that emerged from the 1990s into the, into the present century. But now governments, either directly through re legislation or through the, the, the stock exchanges of uh, governance, are now requiring social and environmental reporting of various sorts. Met quite soft in many cases, hardening in others. Transparency in payments to host governments was an area where initially, well, thanks to international development NGO pressure, some companies tried to be transparent, didn't su 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 succeed so well. Then you get an initiative, I'll bore you with the details um, about this, but then governments in America and in the European Union introduced their own accounting rules requiring transparency of payments to host governments in the resources sector. Procurement standards. Much CSR, often in collaboration with civil society organisations, has developed standards for procurement. In the Norwegian and the Singapore case, I've come across cases where these governments have adopted those, if you like, CSR standards. So again, it seems to me that these, there's interaction between the, the business case and the ethical on, on the one side there and the regulatory. It's not actually that recent. I think there's been a major tide uh, in, in the last two decades, maybe decade to two, but actually it's not even that recent. When I said I started studying these things, it was in the United Kingdom in the early 1980s. Very clear interaction of, of government and CSR, uh, uh, corporations rather, trying to do what the corporations would describe both as the ethical thing, but also seeing a business case for it, and this is particularly in the context of counter-unemployment. So I would be meeting representatives from business organisations who would explain why it's good for business to be engaged in these government programmes. You'll be, they have forgotten that Mr Keating uh, from the 1990s in uh, Australia. He introduced some programmes, it wasn't him personally, it was the Department of Employment, Commonwealth Department of Employment, something rather on training, DEET, I think it was. And again, I, I've studied the impact of these policies and had similar conversations with uh, business representatives. Same in Denmark in the 1990s. I didn't actually study that. Colleagues did. And actually, if you were to go back to the formation of the welfare state and early environmental regulation in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, you again find governments were often picking up ideas, not just the ideas of one nation conservatives like Bismarck or the ideas of social democrats, but also of corporations who had tried to introduce education, housing, and even cleaner cities. So, as I steer towards, I hope, a safe harbour, my conclusions are CSR is multifaceted, and it depends on the interactions of these three core concepts, ethics, business strategy, politics, and obviously the balances will vary enormously. They'll vary particularly by time and place, particularly by time and place, but also the business models in these times and places. It can't be as simple as that, so I welcome your criticisms and comments.